Okay, well, I'm glad that I uh, see you came back. I didn't run, run you all off last week. Uh, going through a review of all that we've accomplished so far is a little overwhelming, uh, but it just kind of sets the stage for where we are this evening. And so this evening we're going to continue into the sixth vision, looking at the victory of Jesus Christ. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the scripture. Father, thank you again for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We pray that as we open our hearts, we open our word, we open your word to our hearts, and we pray you would teach us, you would lead us, you would direct us. You, you are our teacher, we're dependent upon you, and so we open our hearts to you, we become vulnerable to, to be challenged and to learn and to receive from your spirit. And Lord, anything that I have to say, I pray you would edit edit in people's minds and hearts. You would have your way. It's your word that's important. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, on the, the page one of your handouts, uh, it starts up there at the Victorious Christ. This is session two of uh, part five. And I also sent out an email today. If you're not registered, you didn't get it. If you register, you'll get my emails. But I sent the link to last week's class if you would like to watch it, if you missed it, or if you want to go back and say what? Because <laughs> that's what happens a lot of times. Okay, the victorious Christ. We're looking at Revelation 19, uh, 11 to 20, verse 15, this week and next week to complete this sixth vision. So this portion of the vision reveals the motivation there's the motivation behind what we taught last week concerning the four hallelujahs and Christ's victory. And, uh, and so the, the, the fourfold hallelujah and the marriage supper of the Lamb is what we covered. I'm just going to kind of set the stage with that because that is the motivation. That is the foundation for what follows, which is a, which I, 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 in my mind, I see it like when I was a kid, when we got one of those encyclopedias, that if you were studying anatomy, you pull back one laminate page after another, and it goes you know, from, from the skin to the, to the veins and the muscles, to the bones, to the organs. I mean, you know, and so it was like a layers of an anatomy. And the description of Jesus' victory is revealed in the sixth vision, if you look at it that way. So I, I, I maybe, you know, the, the picture can help you, just like the picture of looking at, you know, we've been looking at these visions, now we're going to look, turn it and look through another facet of the jewel of the revelation to see Jesus, the very focus of the revelation, to see what he wants, wants to show us and invite us into. And so as we look into this, it's, I think it's really important, and it's very discounted, I think, in the church today, there's been such a focus on the future, such a focus on escape and the rapture, such a focus on signs of blood moons and lining up of the stars and all, such a focus on that, we're missing the glory of the victory and the gospel of Jesus Christ. What happened almost 2,000 years ago is the very hinge of history. It is the fulfillment of the promise that God gave to humanity, the remedy, which was the seed of the woman that crushed the head of the serpent. It was the victory that Jesus had over sin, Satan, and death itself. All of that happened almost 2,000 years ago. We're not waiting for the kingdom to come. The kingdom is here in our midst. The kingdom of God has changed our whole world. Hundreds of millions of people have been swept into the kingdom, and billions and billions of people, their lives have been altered and improved because of Jesus Christ. His value system, his laws, his people who are transformed, who bring life into this world. And so when we look back, we need to see the victory occurred at the cross and the resurrection. We don't want to look forward to that victory to finally happen. No, it's already done. We well, say, yeah, but I'm still vulnerable. I'm still, well, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You are victorious. We are reigning with him now in heavenly places. We are seated now. And so that idea, brothers and sisters, needs to be heavy on our hearts as we read the scripture instead of looking for something to happen look at what he's already done and let's live in his victory i have a series that i may get to teach next week it's about an eight-week series it's called training in reigning most of us don't we, we act like we're, we're serfs in somebody else's kingdom that's a lie our king is the king of kings and he rules over all. And all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth have been given unto him. When? 
at the defeat that occurred at the cross, the burial, and the resurrection, what we call Easter, unfortunately, Resurrection Day. And we enter into his first resurrection. He was the first fruits. He rose again on the third day. He was the first fruits in the fulfillment of the Passover feast. And he was the first fruits. And we have been entering into him by faith. How? By believing in him and being buried with him in baptism unto death and raised again to newness of life. Brothers and sisters, we have had our first resurrection by faith. And the second resurrection, that is what we anticipate. But we are still in a broken world. We're still in bodies destined to die. This is very temporary, and everybody goes through it. Most every human being that's ever lived on Earth has already experienced it. So the you know, sociologists can guesstimate at the number of humans that have ever existed on the Earth, and they guess, guess somewhere between 15, 18 billion people who've ever lived on the Earth in the few millennia of our existence. Well, right now, there's what, about 8 billion people on the Earth? So that means that half of the people who ever lived have already died. And all those who are alive today, we're only a, bit, a few more days and we'll be with him. And so this, when we make it all about us and all about now, we are setting ourselves up for deception. And so the victory of Christ is what we need to enter into. The victory of Christ is where we need to live. We need to learn that we rule and reign with him. And he sits in heavenly places. He's given us access directly to his throne anytime we want. We don't have to wait for one high priest from one tribe for one day a year to go through two weeks of preparation and then tie a rope to his leg in case he didn't do it right. So that when he goes into the presence of God, they, can, they don't hear the bells tinkle anymore. They can pull his body out. That's, how, that's what it used to be on the day on Yom Kippur. One day a year is, is when, when the high priest had access to God. But we have access. In Hebrews 4, he says, Come boldly before my throne to receive mercy and grace in time of need, anytime, anybody, he's given access, an invitation. So as we restate the celebration of Jesus' great victory over the rebellious world, sinful flesh, and the great deceiver, Satan, this is what the foundation of the four hallelujahs, this is the motivation of the hallelujahs. And the first one we taught, taught last week, just as a reminder, the first one was about justice, divine justice. The second one was celebrating uh, divine retribution. The third one was celebrating divine order as it came down, you know, just like it said in the, in the first or the second vision before the throne of God. It talks about this divine order of delegated authority into his creation. That's what, the, that's, what that's all about, about the throne and the lamb and the four creatures and the 24 elders and the sea of glass. That's all God's delegated authority into his creation. And so we see they celebrate divine order and then, of course, divine worship, which we participate in continually. So the, this vision reveals a celebration of the Lord's bondservants along with the heavenly hosts as a result of all previously revealed judgments over sin, death, and the grave, over the world, the flesh, and the devil, over the beasts of the sea, the beasts of the earth, and the dragon himself. So this is the glorious consummation of the groom and his bride at the marriage supper of the Lamb with a celebration of Jesus' long procession of victory, including the overthrow of earthly kings, including the binding of Satan, including the introduction of what's called the millennial reign. And listen to this, the millennial reign in Christ, in the earth, in these last days. What are the last days? The last days are between Christ's first coming and his second coming. You read everything that was written right after Jesus' ascension, and he said these are called these last days. Now, we've been trained for the last 50, 75 years to look for the last days and look for signs of the last days, and we're getting closer to the last days. Well, we're, we're closer to the end of the age than we've ever been. But how long do we go? It's in the Lord's timing, in the fullness of time. Who knows that? Only the Father. That's what Jesus said. Only the Father knows. So, I mean, it took, what, 4,000 years from from the creation to the cross. We think, why did it take so long? He prophesied it in the garden. You know, instead what they had to do, we had to go through the flood, we had to go through all. Well, there was a process that God does to prepare his people for their purpose. And what's a man's purpose but to rule and reign with him, to be co-workers with him in his creation for eternity. This is what we're being prepared for. So we're talking about the millennial reign of Christ in the earth in these last days prior to his final judgment. And that's what we're going to see in the unfolding of these layers in this 
uh, celebration of Christ's victory. So the concluding exposure of the satanically inspired rebellion against God as Satan is released for a very brief period prior to the end of judgment. We see that in chapter 20, and I'll, touch on, I'll talk about that next week. The concluding exposure of the satanically inspired rebellion. In other words, it's continually going, and it, and it leads to this final judgment because it exposes all those who are rebelling against God. And then, that, of course, that concludes with the great white throne judgment of Christ on all of creation satanic influences and of humanity in what's called the second death now do we go to the to the judgment seat of christ yes are we judged for our sin no jesus already took that judgment what do we judge for paul said live your life in such a way that what you produce is not wood hay and stubble but gold and silver and precious jewels we want to go through the fire of his presence and have something eternal and that's what happens at the judgment seat of christ and then last week, we, in the conclusion of that, in chapter 19, verse 10, the second half, it says, the, 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 the angel, the messenger who told John, get up, don't worship me, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. He said, he said, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, that's a maxim. That's a biblical maxim. When I, when I first saw that, and I saw that, as it just exploded in my mind, because you know most people completely misunderstand prophecy as well. Prophecy is a gift that people have that can bring inspiration. It speaks forth, and sometimes we even call people futurists who look forward into the future and they announce things. That's what most science fiction writers are. They're futurists who put it into a story. But that gift needs to be sanctified for God to be the, the source of that inspiration. So now they're speaking forth God's word and they're foretelling God's mysteries. But all, all gifts are that way. That's why in Romans 12, three to eight, Prophecy is the first gift that's mentioned. Because what does Paul, Peter, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, he says, he says that, that I desire that, all, that you all prophesy. That you all, you all should be prophets. We should all be speaking forth God's word into his creation. That's a way of life for a believer. Because we have access to his word. So when we look at this, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, everything centers on testifying who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and what he's doing right now, ruling and reigning and interceding. Like it says in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in his son. So the prophetic word, everything that is centered on biblical prophecy centers on Messiah himself. Everything's about Jesus. He is the final word. So he's continually revealed. And then I listed through each of the visions there in number three. He's continually revealed in the first vision as the glorified Christ in the midst of the church. He's revealed in the second vision as the Lamb of God from the foundations of the earth. He's revealed in the third vision as the male child who is, is to rule the nations with a rod of iron and caught up to, to God and to his throne. In the fourth vision, he's revealed as the one receiving the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. In the fifth vision, the Lamb, he's the Lamb that wages war and overcomes. Romans, Revelation 17, 14 says, this, These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are, call, are the called and the chosen and faithful. And then in the sixth vision, we see the glorified Christ, which is studying tonight, at the consummation of the age. That means th there's a former day in this age, it's, it's based in the former days, which are creation to the cross, and the latter days from the cross to the end of the age. And that's the way scripture reveals. So there is a consummation of the former days that we look back historically now and see the fulfillment of all of Daniel's prophecies leading to the, to the uh, destruction of the Roman Empire, the last global empire that dominated the earth. And, and we see its destruction, which ultimately destroyed the temple, Jerusalem, and the whole sacrificial system, of which Jesus prophesied not one stone would be left upon another because he was going to fulfill all of that. And this was the final judgment, the last days of that former, the former days, the last, the last great day of the Lord of the former days. And then the end of this age, there's yet another great day of the Lord. And that's what we read about in the conclusion of each one of these visions. When we see the destruction, the ultimate destruction that falls when the wrath of God 
that's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness comes to a conclusion. And so that's the end of this age. How long is that going to be? Could be today. Could be a thousand years from now. I know a thousand years ago, I read history, a thousand years ago they were preparing for the end of the age because that was the end of a thousand year period. And, and of course, and then what, what happened at Y2K? Everybody was expecting, this is it. We're getting into the seventh millennium. This is gonna be it. What happened? Here we are now, 20, uh, 23, 24 years into the third millennium now, according to the proper calendar. And uh, we're still waiting, we're still looking, we're still watching, we're loving his appearing, but we're living every day like this is the day. But we have to work every day like we have 100 years. So. In this sixth vision, like I said, the glorified and victorious Christ at the consummation of this age. Psalm 103, 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. Now, see, we're talking about victory already. Listen. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. It's written about 3,000 years ago. See, we need to have a comprehension that's got a heavenly perspective. We need to understand that God sits on the throne. So we can watch all the chaos, and we, and we should be praying for all the poor souls in Afghanistan, but in so many other places of the world, it's just like it. Can you imagine what's going on with the Uyghurs in northern China? Can you imagine what's going on in Africa right now? Can you imagine? I mean, these places where there is, they are destroying whole tribes of people just because they're not theirs. And, so, and, and we live in, in a lap of luxury, and, and we get upset if we have to sit at a red light too long. I do. Anyway. <laughs> I got places to go, people to see, things to do. That's, that's what I keep telling myself. Anyway, but, you know, it's, it, we need to be praying. But at the same time, this has been going on for a long time. But we know who sits on the throne. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. I know who sits on the throne. It doesn't matter what the, what the, the uh, dictatorial leaders of, of nations do. I know who sits on the throne. And he says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it whichever way he wants. God's sovereignty rules over all. That should bring comfort to our hearts and confidence when we pray. If we move into despair, we have been deceived. If we move into hopelessness, we have been defeated. That's what the enemy wants. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the first thing he's going to steal is your hope. So God wants us to build that up. The anatomy of Jesus celebration, then number four, celebrated this, the victory in seven layers. So I just kind of listed them there, uh, starting with layer number seven. So we're going seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And you can see the scriptures from 1911 through 16 to layer one at 2011 to 15. So as you go through these layers, and I'm going to go through one by one here. I just listed them here to begin with so you can see the flow. I don't know about you, I love outline flows. That helps me to, to keep things in order. And especially when you're looking at complicated things. So this, this little booklet here is my outline for my commentary that I hope to get published this year. And so I've got to turn my outline into paragraphs now. <laughs> but, uh, but the thing is, that it, it helps us. And so that list on number four at the bottom of page one is the seven layers of victory. So let's begin in chapter 19, verse 11, the victory and ministry of Jesus Christ. This is the top of page two. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth come a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we see this victory announced and proclaimed at the beginning of this uh, picture of how he accomplished his victory. So note uh, the announcement at his first coming. In, in John chapter 12, this is what Jesus said almost 2,000 years ago, verse 31 and 32. Now judgment is upon this world. 
Now the rulers of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to himself. So I'm, I'm hoping that this idea that I've been talking about now for 20 minutes, about the, the king and his kingdom, and that he rules even now. We're not looking for him to become victorious. He is victorious. We're not looking for him to become with all authority. He has all authority. He rules and reigns over all. I mean, what is the Great Commission? Go into all the world, proclaim his name, baptize and make disciples. For all authority in heaven and on earth have been, past tense, given to me. All authority. And so we're not waiting for this to happen. We're not waiting for him to be crowned king. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And so when we're looking at this, we can, and this was, the, this was the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, that remedy that God announced to Adam and Eve and to the snake, that he said that through the seed of the woman, who was the source of the, of the uh, temptation and snare, through that very person, he's going to bring the remedy the seed of the woman, and he will crush the head of the enemy. That has occurred. We have Satan under our feet, and that's where he needs to stay. Don't let him out. If he starts talking, time to shut up. Don't listen to him. In that next series I'm going to do in October, that's what it's going to talk about. It's talking about taking every thought captive unto the obedience of Christ, because this is where the battle occurs, right here between the ears. Stuff happens, but it isn't about what happens, it's how we respond to what happens. Did you hear that? Life isn't about what happens to us. Life happens. It's how we respond to what happens to us. And, what, and Jesus is our model. He went like a sheep. And there's times when you fight and there's times when you don't. I mean, he is the lion and the lamb. I'd love to do a series on, on the, uh, the natures that we, that we become because we're in Christ. The nature of the war horse in, in Job 39. The nature of the eagle that's all through the scripture. The nature of the lion. The nature of the lamb. That, that's who we are in him. So there, we need to learn to understand how we, how, when we act in those, those natures that have been empowered by his Holy Spirit in us. But that's who we are. We rule and reign with him. Isaiah 11, 1 to 5, he says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. A spirit of, spirit of uh, let me see, I missed one. Rest, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Seven spirits of the Lord that are talked about two or three places. And he will delight in the, in, he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what the... The, the poor and, the, and decide the fairness and for the afflicted of the earth and he will strike the earth and with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt uh, uh, about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. So when we're looking up the scriptures, all the things that have been prophesied about Messiah, remember when this occurred almost 2,000 years ago. We have been living in his victory and it's a choice whether we are reigning with him or we're living in despair and defeat. That's our choice. On the, and then the next point is that he is called the Lord of hosts. And uh, I put the, the Hebrew in there. The Yahweh, uh, Y-H-W-H, is the, is the word that is used without any vowels because it was too holy to say. And so the Jews would, just took out the vowels. And, but it was a pronunciation of when Moses said, who do people, who should I say send me? Who are you? He goes, I am that I am. And so when you translate I am, this isn't Popeye talking. I am what I am, you know. And he says, so he, I, I am. I'm not, I always was, I always, I always am, and I always will be. And so Yahweh, Yahweh Elohe Tzvets, I can't say it, Tzvets. Sab Sabaoth, we say, the Lord of the hosts, the heavenly hosts, all of those who rule and reign with him, all of those heavenly beings and earthly beings who are now with him. I mean, he led captivity captive on his resurrection into the presence of God. How many was that? Oh, only the Lord knows. But we get to join in, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, I had some information about Lord of hosts on there. You can study that out. There's 260 times just in the Old Testament that that's mentioned. First mentioned in 1 Samuel 1, 3, the first half. So the, the word host is a translation, Hebrew word, sabaoth, meaning armies. 
the angelic armies of heaven. Verse 11, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Note the transition from the first verse, he said, I heard. Remember, these are the transitional points in the Revelation. He's, he's concluding the, the vision of, of the doom of Babylon, and all of a sudden he says, and, and I heard in the heavenlies. You know, when we say heavenlies, the, the, the word that's translated heaven, it just means that we look up. <laughs> we're we're look, something above us, something bigger than us, something that's ethereal, something that is imminent, something that is right here, right now. And so he says, that, and he saw heaven open. So when, when he said that, I saw this. So I, I heard it at first, and then now I saw. So we see this transition from I heard to I saw, from verse 1 to verse 11. The first thing he saw was a white horse, and that's the symbol of righteous power. And the writer, faithful and true. So let me make a point here. This, the context of this vision and this, what he just saw, clarifies that this is not the same white horse of the four horsemen of the apocalypse that we see in the breaking of the first seal in the, in the second vision. Because we know that those four horsemen represent uh, the, the loose, loosing of authorities that cause problems. I, and when I, I taught that in great detail. But the first horse, the white horse, and the rider had on a gold crown, dressed in white, and he had, on, he had a bow and arrow, because people who are in charge are not usually face-to-face -face in battle, they do it from a distance, okay? But an authority is all delegated from God, so this represented human government. But human government that's perverted produces anarchy, which was the second horse of the apocalypse, okay? So we went from, from the first horse, the white horse of, of government authority, the second horse of anarchy, the third horse of, of uh, financial uh, corruption, and then the fourth horse, which is death, which it produces. And so then we go through, we went through that release of those things, which was the death, the judgment of death that came on humanity because of the fall. So this is not the white horse of the first seal. So the, the very source of the celebration as Jesus' ministry is, re, is revisited is restating the conclusion of judgment and the justice of God. This is the remedy. And uh, it's a repeat of chapter one, and we'll, get, we'll look at that in just a second. So as we, look through the, as we look through the facet of the sixth vision, we can see reflections of the first vision, the glorified Christ and the victorious Christ, just like we can see the Lamb of God. We can see, so we see the male child. We see the things that have been revealed, but from a different perspective. So this is, in, it says that he judges and he wages war. 11.4 of Isaiah says, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth and he will strike the earth with a rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked and so the judgment has always been a component or expression of his authority he sits in heaven and rules over all God sits in heaven and laughs. I love that phrase that's found in the, in the Psalms. God sits in heaven and laughs. I mean it's like it's, it's like, when, you know, I, I remember when my, when my boys, who are both bigger than me now, but I remember when they were little bitty and, they, and that they did something to, you know, oppose or stand against or resist. I can remember when they were really little, you know, and we had these cool overalls. I just reached down and pick them up and hold them up and say, what, what are you saying? You know, and it's like, if, if I did that to my, to my little boy, how much does God look at us and go, what? What did you say? You said no. Is that what you said? No. <laughs> I mean, he, he sits in heaven and he laughs. But he loves us even like we are. I mean, he's, before we ever even acknowledged him, he sent his son to die for us. That's how much he loves us. Psalm 2, listen. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a great, great thing, a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. 
Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he may not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Aren't you glad that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and we can take refuge in him? And so the judgment that we're seeing displayed and, and, and revealed and opened up and completed in the book of Revelation has been discussed and, and exposed throughout Scripture as God has revealed his nature to us. It says in verse 12, His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except Himself. Again, this is a reference to Revelation 1, revealing his purity and his judgment. It says in verses 12 to 16 of chapter 1, remember this is the glorified Christ that's, that's begin the, the expression of everything. He says, Then I turned to see the voice which was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in, in a robe, reaching to his feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire his feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of many waters in his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the shining the sun shining in strength so we see the picture of the glorified christ the burnt the, the the feet that are like burnished bronze that's talking bronze is the metal of judgment throughout the scripture and it's talking about his where he stands he stands in judgment Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way except for you look for God's provision. And the one that you call out, God save me. That's his name. God save me. Yeshua. That's what it means. Lord saves. And so when we look to this, we see the glorified Christ. Psalm 97, verses 1 to 4. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many islands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about. His lightnings lit up the world. The earth saw and trembled. Now, we love it when we see the adversaries of God come under judgment. But his judgment is in the earth. And so we want our lives to bear his light and to carry his presence and to produce an eternal reward, not just the temporary things that, uh, t that, that really lead us astray. 1 Corinthians 3.13, Paul writes, Now if any man builds on the foundation, which is gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. This is the great white throne when we go before, like I talked about earlier. And I'll talk about it more next week. Many diadems he's talking about. That's the plurality of crowns that points to his character and authority as the king of kings, the lord of lords. It says that he has a name. Now, this is kind of mysterious. He has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. And as I prayed about that, I mean, we know that he, is the, that he is the word of God. He is the king of kings. We know that he is the lamb and every other fulfilled promise that yet receives a new name at the conclusion of his ministry and his redemption. So now he's coming in. This is the, his, his ultimate victory. The marriage supper of the lamb has occurred and they're celebrating his victory, his retribution, his justice and, and his, his uh, uh, divinity. And, and now it, this is a divine revelation. This new name, I believe, is a divine revelation of God to his bondservants in the consummation of all things. So in other words, we're going to know Jesus in a new way in all the ages to come because of his great victory. A name which nobody else knows. You have a name, too, that God has that he hadn't told you yet. But in uh, naming, you know, in our culture, names don't really mean anything. It's like what's the most popular movie, you know, and so you like that person, so you name them after that, you know. But names used to be important. They used to be prophetic. They used to be descriptive. And in fact, most of our names, if we'd study them back, they came from some, you know, uh, like my last name is Killeen. It's an Irish Killeen. It means it's a, it's, a, it's a cell structure. And I did some research a number of years ago, back, I'll clear back on our 30th anniversary, we went to Ireland. And uh, I found out that the, Killeen, the, the word kill in, in the Gaelic language talks about the cell or the home. And, and the Killeen tribe was part of a settlement called Clan McNoy. And Clan McNoy or Clan McNeish, it was, it was a settlement of which the Killeen tribe was the dominant or the protection of that, that's called the Aranaw tribe, of that, of that clan for 700 years. 
And so the name meant that I was that, that we were supposed to be a people who were in a position to protect, be in a position to oversee, be in a position to allow people to flourish. And so I really hold on to that. I love the fact. And then, and, and then of course, it also means one who strives. So the people who do that strive. I mean, you ask any policeman, you ask anybody. I mean, I was a policeman in the Army. I remember. It's constant striving. And so, uh, but anyway, when, when you live up to your name, it really motivates you. And I tell people to study your name. You may have things you don't know. Like all the inmates in my, in my class that I'm teaching right now in the Bible survey, uh, I get a pic their picture and their name before the class starts. So I go through and I study each one of their names and I find out what they're called. So, you know, one, you know one, your, name, your name means peaceful. Your name means victory. Your name, mean, you know, and, so, I, and I, so when I address them, I talk and I said, you know what your name means? And it just kind of like, wow, really? That's pretty cool, you know? And so I, I, I challenge you to do that because names mean something. And, and uh, if we go back, you know, we would probably do things different if we, if we had that prophetic sense. And that, now the Hebrews, they, you know, that, they named people. In fact, language was simpler and more direct, and they named people based on a prophetic sense of what they expected or of what they anticipated. And so, like I said, ours, we go back, you know, people who are tailors, that's because their family was in the tailor business. People who were millers, they were milling, you know, whatever. Anyway, so they had, we had names that described, you know, because of the way the world is today. So I always go by, my name is Richard Jeffrey Colleen. Richard means lion-hearted. Jeffrey Godfrey means lover of God. And Colleen means one who strives. So I'm going to try to live up to it. <laughs> but I challenge you to do that. I mean, because names are really important. And God gives Jesus another name. The Father gives him a name that is manifesting his victory in the, in the new world and the new life to come, the new ages to come. Verse 13, he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, we know in Le Leviticus 17, 11, that the life of the body is in the blood. I got caught up this week, spent hours studying uh, answers in Genesis, explanation of the blood. It's just mind-blowing, the irreducible uh, uh, complexity of the blood and the, ve and the vessels and the system. There is no way any of this is an accident. There's just no way. I don't know if you know what an irreducible complexity is. That means that everything has to be working at once or everything dies. And almost everything in creation is proven to be that way. Of course, people don't believe in God, so they try to, try to explain it without God. But uh, when I was reading this, the life was in the blood. When the blood is on, his, on his, uh, his robe, that's dipped in blood, it says. And so he, he is the source of life. Isaiah 63, 2 and 3 says, Why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? Answer, I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. So he's talking about judgment that is exposed, because he's the one that brings judgment. We're not out there fighting with swords or bullets or bombs. or anything. He, It's the word of his mouth comes out like a two-edged sword to destroy those who oppose him. So Jesus is the righteous judge, worthy to exact judgment on his rebellious creation, both men and devils. And the robe dipped in blood could refer to both the blood he shed for our judgment, because that judgment came on him, my judgment came on him, and those who reject his sacrifice. And so the, the scripture doesn't say, it just says he was robed in, his robe was dipped in blood. But I see both things as possibilities. And he is called the Word of God. He's also mentioned in John's writings in John 1, 1 and 1 John 1, 1, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten of the Father. And then verse 14, and on, uh, it says, the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. It didn't say we were doing battle. We were just following him. And that's what we do now as we training, train in our reigning is that we follow him and we just walk with him and we, we're about his business. Let's be about his business. Let's follow him. Let's stay in the dust of the master's sandals. These are all the hosts of heaven is talking about that, that are celebrating the marriage supper of the lamb as well as the angelic. So it's the angelic and the redeemed. The hosts of heaven are following him. Revelation 17, 14, these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called the chosen and the faithful. 
So this is the bride of Revelation 19.8, clothed in fine linen. We also see it in 6.11 and 19.8. And they're both talking about the, the same picture of their being clothed in white. Verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. So the references, I've got a lot of references there in Revelation 1, 16, 2, 12, 2, 16, uh, 2, 27, 7, 5, all to the two-edged sword. You know, the two-edged sword that's talked about in Hebrews 4, it, it, it's like it's, it cuts both ways. And so it, it talks about cutting in the sense of judgment, but it's also about penetration between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. The, the word of God is able to expose that which is true, and it defeats that which is not. The two-edged sword. His creative and judging two-sided sword that proceeds where? From his mouth. It's his word that's being spoken. Remember, God's word is creative. God said, God saw, it was good. God said, God saw, it was good. Everything that is is because God said. And he holds all things together by the word of his power. And it's his word that will conclude all things. And as long as we are in him, brothers and sisters, we have nothing to fear. We have no one to fear but God himself. That's the beginning of wisdom itself. So his creative and judged, judging two-sided sword. Hebrews 4.12, that was the scripture I was just referencing. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of the soul and the spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The penetration of his word is what brings life or brings judgment. Verse 16, now we're on top of page 3 of your notes. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. On his thigh, this is the place where the scabbard was tied. So the scabbard was tied to the leg and to the hip at the belt. And so, this, and so where, this, where the sword was usually, is usually, uh, he has his name because that's his authority. And he carries, it's who he is. That's how he moves. He wears a new name of his completed work in his creation. Revelation 17, 14. These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. So this is referenced a couple times in this, this section here. But this vision of celebration recognizes Jesus' true place in creation. In verses 17, 18, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in the mid heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and the great. So when he says, I saw an angel standing in the sun, that represents a messenger that comes from God's throne. And this is, this is a, a, a sense or a picture, a symbol of the source of its authority. In the historical reference to the carnage of war, all through the scripture we see this, where when the birds are there eating and cleaning up all the mess, that you know, birds always, always reference two things in the Bible, demonic forces and the cleanup mess. <laughs> they come in after war to, to pick the bones clean, you know? And so it's a, it's a picture of total and complete victory. That's what it's a picture of. So John sees this vision, uh, in this vision, the conclusive result of Jesus' ministry that fulfills the Genesis 3.15 promise of remedy that crushes the head of the serpent. This vision describes a final gathering of the ungodly, the final gathering of the wicked. The bloody feast of judgment stands in contrast to the, what we see at the beginning, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So in victory, we celebrate at the marriage supper of the Lamb where those who have rejected God are now in this carnage, which is a different meal. The imagery is given in Ezekiel 39, 17. As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every kind of bird and to every beast of the field. Assemble and come together from every side to my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you. As a great sacrifice on the mountain of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. So you will eat the fat until you are glutted and drink the blood until you are drunk. From my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you, you will be glutted at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men, and all the men of war, declares the Lord. His judgment is fierce. His judgment is complete. Verse 19, 
1919, the doom of the beast and the false prophet. He says, and then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army and his beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which came from his mouth from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds of the were filled with their flesh. Now we could spend another couple hours right here because of our application of what was revealed in two previous visions about the beast of the of the sea, the beast of the earth, and the false prophet. And the, the expressions that I gave, you know, whole hours on each one of those before, uh, is, is applied here. So as we're looking through the through the. Um, the current vision, the facet of the stone, we're seeing a reflection now that those who stood in that place of deception and authority that deceived the earth and brought death and threat to everyone are immediately thrown into the lake of fire. These, are, these come under great judgment. Right now in the earth, all we have is the symbols of them. All of those who rise up out of the chaos of humanity and set up systems of destruction. This is the beast of the sea and the beast in the uh, in the beast of the of the earth and the prophetic voices we hear coming from the prophets of Baal mostly out of Washington and uh, California and Beijing and in and, and all over the all over the world where the leaders who lead with destruction are are speaking and then of course they have all of those who echo in the media their prof prophetic words so anyway when we talk about this again without having Going, without going back and teaching those other visions that talked about those three characters, you can see here that they were bound and, and thrown into the lake of fire. Now, we need to understand that, that, the, that the expression of these characters were primarily revealed at the fall of Jerusalem. The Roman Empire, Nero, and, and his uh, spokesman that, were, that resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple and the sacrificial system. And the, there has not been an empire since, for 2,000 years, there's not been a global empire. Now, there's been nations like, like uh, England who said that the sun never set on the British Empire, and it became like the, the, the final Rome. But then Rome, uh, Moscow calls itself the third Rome, and it redeveloped its whole city into seven rings, so it matched scripturally, and they consider themselves, you know, there's been, there's been a lot of things, but there's never been a Roman Empire. That was the longest living, the most fierce, the most destructive, just as was prophesied by Daniel. And so I believe that when, when Jerusalem fell, those, those characters that were exposed, and, he, and they were exposed even by the name, Nero 666, was exposed at that time for those who were alive, those who had wisdom. They knew who he was, and they knew who they were up against. But the reflection of those, just like all of the kingdoms, of, of Egypt and Assyria, of Babylon, of Medo-Persia, of, of Greece and of Rome, all of the influence of those kingdoms are still at work in the world today, but not at the same level. And so I believe they were thrown into the lake of fire. They have not been active and will not be for the rest of the age. Now, the demonic forces are still at work. The lies are still out there. They're still propagated in our world, but we can see that they have been thrown in. And so when we get into next week, we're going to see probably the, the only, the most complicated, or not complicated, the most confrontational six verses in the book of Revelation, talking about the millennial reign in that thousand year period. Because we don't understand the rest of the book, we assign meaning to that, which makes it very difficult to apply. And, and also it gets off into uh, some teaching that is very destructive. And so I'll talk about that next week, but we can see here that the destruction of all earthly manifestations of satanic, satanic rule and power a complete re recapitulation of Jesus' defeat of Satan and his termination is revealed. This is the final blow on the enemies of God of his, and of his kingdom of the world, the flesh, and the devil, symbolized by the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies. And then we see the, the word, the lake of fire introduced here, revealed as the final and complete judgment of God. This judgment is mentioned four times in uh, Revelation 19 and 20. It's the description of the final judgment on Lucifer and his rebellious followers. The description of fire and brimstone. It's like it says in scripture, it was not created for man, but for Lucifer and those that followed him. What was symbolically portrayed in the third vision of, of the dragon and his tail who swept away a third of heaven. So the description of fire and brimstone is the description of the punishment of the wicked as seen in Genesis 19.24 in the doom of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Psalm 11, five to seven, the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain snares, fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness. The upright, upright will, be, will behold his face. And if you study Ezekiel 38 and 39, Ezekiel prophesies the final battle with similar descriptions that we're going to see in the next few verses. In this, uh, this second death, this, this, this lake of fire, this place of the dead, uh, before it was called Sheol, and, there's this, and, and until humans who go to the place of the dead uh, are ultimately judged at the judgment seat, at the white throne judgment, they will, they will end up in the lake of fire. And so when you talk about the place of the dead, we use the words hell, the grave, Hades, Sheol, Gehenna, and Lake of Fire. And the context determines whether you're just talking about generally the place of the dead or specifically the place of the dead who are under judgment. So like when Jesus talked about Lazarus and the rich man, they both died and went to the place of the dead. But Abraham, the, is, is, it's called the bosom of Abraham, which was paradise before Christ reconciled them back to the Father. And, those, and then there were those who, were, who had rejected God and his ways, and they, they were burning with fire. So you remember that, that uh, he cried out, can you send Lazarus with a drip of water, you know? Well, then can you go back and tell my brothers this is real? And he says, no, even if somebody rises from the dead, they're not going to believe. And so he was prophesying how many people who reject will still reject. The place of the dead, the judgment that falls on rebellious humanity, concludes with an ultimate destination with the deceiver himself, the lake of fire. The delineation of the punishment of the first and the second death is a progressive revelation. So we are learning about death and the progression of death. It's introduced in scripture. We know throughout scripture about the introduction of, from the oldest book in the Bible, uh, from Job, talks about resurrection, but we also talk about eternal judgment. And so this is what's endured and uh, what, what's uh, inferred here. First in the Old Testament, it begins in Genesis 2.17 when he talks about, if you eat this, you will die. And so what is that death but a separation? And that separation has produced all that was revealed in the second vision as those seven seals were broken. Isaiah 64, 22, for just as the new heavens and the new earth will make, I, which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon and from the Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. So back in Isaiah, he's prophesying the clarity of this progression and separation in death. And the revelation of the resurrection is inferred, like I said, in, in Job and in Psalms and in lots of other places. Daniel 2, 12, 2 says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. That's what we're seeing disclosed here in this chapter. And, of course, we know the uh, promises. Uh, Psalm 16, 11, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And, of course, we all love Psalm 23. Verse 6 says, Surely goodness and kindness, loving kindness, will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the judgment of God throughout Scripture is a reference to his holiness and the cleansing fire of his presence. And of course, at the great white throne where his presence, everything comes into his presence, the ultimate and final judgment falls. Nahum 1 6, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? The wrath is poured out like fire, and rocks are broken up by him. Deuteronomy 4 24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Jeremiah 4, 4, circumcise yourselves in the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judah and inhabit, inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because the, of the evil of your deeds. These are, these are uh, heart-shaking realities when we, when we realize, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He is holy. When we take him for granted, when we justify things, say, well, you know, 
Jesus loves me anyway. And it's a dangerous, slippery slope that Paul warns the disciples. If you read Ephesians 4, 17 and following, it's like this slippery slope. He says, he says you did not learn Christ in this way. He said, but when you begin to talk like you used to talk and walk like you used to walk and hang with those you used to hang with, he says, then your mind becomes clouded. You become, uh, you become calloused in your arrogance and your, your heart is calloused and you can no longer, it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. And there's a lot of people living on the edge. Only God knows people's hearts. That's why I don't give pat answers at funerals. I don't say, oh, they're, all, they're in a better place. Only God knows their hearts. I'm not going to say that. I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm not, I, I want to help them understand the gospel and the hope. Now, I, I do amplify and testify to what we do know about someone's life. Because the fruit that, that their life produces gives us hope that they really knew God. And we know what the scripture says. And so, you know, we, we trust in, the, in God's faithfulness and we trust in his judgment. But we, we aren't God. That's why, that's why Jesus says, hey, pay attention to the log in your own eye before you start judging everybody else around you. Only let, the, only let God do that. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and he's the only one that knows people's hearts. The only one. So anyway, there's a lot of scriptures. Malachi 3.2, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and a fuller's hope. So the first death as a result of sin of man is defeated by Jesus on the cross, and he has the keys of hell and of death, revealing his authority to release people from the death brought by Adam's sin. This is what occurred when he led captivity captive. Jesus describes the environment of those who die in faith as residing in Abraham's bosom. So that's what I talked about earlier in Luke 16, 23. So from creation to the cross, those who died in faith in God's prov provided remedy that he announced were held in paradise, a spiritual residence described as Abraham's bosom in the depths of the earth, the place of the dead, Sheol. But the cross, from the cross to the end of the age, Jesus' second coming, scripture clearly states that our residence is in, in like it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 8, for we know that if this earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, for indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, will but not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who has who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us his spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that, we, that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and rather prefer to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may re be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to that which he has done, whether good or bad. Now there's a lot of scriptures that we could go in. I have 1 Corinthians 15, 51 there, talking about the, the, what we call the rapture. Behold, I tell you a mystery, he says. We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, uh, when does that happen? We saw that at the end of the second vision, the seventh trump. Right then, that's when, when that seventh trump is blown. That's when the, the bowls get poured out. That's when the, the, the final things occur, the seven thunders. I mean, it's all happening at once. But at that last trump, when it sounds, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We're talking about the victorious Christ. This is his victory. That's why he says in verse 18 of chapter 1, Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. So when we start talking about the second death, this permanent separation and ultimate and eternal judgment of God, we're talking about the, the conclusion of all of those who have resisted him and not received his mercy. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, and into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. In verse 46, he says, These will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. 
In 2010 of Revelation, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. And we're going to get into that next week, and we're going to see the conclusion uh, that he's thrown into the fire with the beast and the false prophet, and they will be tormented day and night forever. And in conclusion, I have a number of scriptures here, and uh, we're out of time, but I just I put them all listed in your in your notes here. Revelation 20, 13, 13 to 15, uh, Revelation 20, verse 8, 19, 20, 8. Matthew 18, 8, all of these scriptures are talking about the, the ultimate and complete and final judgment. So it's all through the scriptures. It's not just Jesus' words. It's not just revelation. It's all through the scriptures. So what we're looking at is the victorious Christ. And we're looking at the anatomy of his victory. So as we, as we look at the anatomy of his victory, and, and uh, we've walked through so far... The, the seventh layer, the victorious Christ. We see the final thing at the marriage supper of the Lamb, celebrations going on, and then they start pulling back the, the, the uh, layers to reveal his victory. First, as the enemies are exposed and defeated, and then as the enemies are described, that led the rebellion, and then Jesus' victory on the cross resulting in Satan's defeat, and then next week we're going to get into the faithful described as reigning with Jesus in the final exposure, judgment, and battle of this age, ultimately concluding in the great white throne. So I, I, I just, I don't know, I probably read this chapter 50 times in the last few weeks, just over and over and over. And it's just, it's really, it, there's something cathartic about seeing conclusion. It's like when the trash man comes and they dump everything in the back and they hit that button and it all goes away. It's like, okay, it's done. I can't go back and get it. I don't need to go through it. I don't need, you know, it's gone. It's cathartic. Now my wife, she just swoons. But anyway, she loves seeing things thrown away. She should be in charge of hell. Just burn everything, right? So just get, just get rid of it. Well, this is, there's something happens in chapter 19 that does that, exposing the victory, the celebration. And that's what I hope that you see as we meditate on and consider the fact that Jesus is victorious. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. And thank you that we can live in your victory. We thank you that you've given us your spirit. You've given us access to your throne. You've given us your word, and now you've given us our marching orders to go into all the world. I pray that each one of us would become more and more alive to the reality of your leading and your direction so that we can bring your kingdom to everyone that we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen.